Thank you so much. This is, uh, I think, the fifth event that I've done at PRS in a period of about 72 hours. It's been a very active visit, and this is such a delightful evening because of the friends who are here tonight. Not only Dr. Stefan Heller, who's one of the most significant scholars of esotericism of the 20th century, and it's always an honor to be in his presence, but to my shock and delight, he brought with him two of my good colleagues from the Northeast, from the Theosophical Society, John and Susan O'Neill, who I had no idea would be visiting. And I hope I don't disappoint them in my presentation because as I often tell people, uh, back East at gatherings of the Theosophical Society, either at lodge meetings or at Pumpkin Hollow or other retreat centers, uh, talks and lectures are these hours-long Wagnerian epics and we break for lunch or for a, a light meal and then we come back together and talk into the night you know so this is the first time they'll see me where I'm not speaking for six hours on some sweep of history from ancient Babylon you know up through the publication of the secret and tonight's talk is going to be more abbreviated so I, I hope you'll give me a pass on this for this <laughs> evening in fact Next week, I'm giving a talk at the uh, Grand Freemasonic Lodge of New York State, and the talk is gonna be about 45 minutes. I've never done anything in 45 minutes, so I have no idea what I'm gonna do. By the time my opening remarks are over, they'll be flicking the lights. But tonight's talk will be somewhat of a more abbreviated talk. Um, Greg uh, Sawyer was concerned about me that uh, maybe I was burning the candle at both ends and with all the talks and other activities that I do when I'm out here that I wasn't giving myself any time to sort of relax and I spent the day today deeply immersed in esoteric study in Anaheim, California where I made my first visit to uh, Disneyland. They gave me this very nice button. They spelled Mitch with mouse ears. I thought it was very thoughtful and I enjoyed it enormously. Um, <laughs> And it's interesting how w wherever you are, you find aspects of our esoteric history hidden in plain sight, as it were. And <clears throat> the good friends who took me on this tour of Disneyland today brought me to a hotel on the grounds that is specifically designed in the British and American arts and crafts style. The arts and crafts movement was a movement that grew in Great Britain uh, under the stewardship of a man named William Morris as a reaction against the mass production of the industrial age. And Morris felt that we were losing something of the human spirit in all the mass produced uh, furniture and dishware and other things that were starting to get uh, churned out uh, in the 1890s and he endorsed the idea of a kind of a back to basics movement where we would begin to learn how to make things with our hands again and honor artisanship and craftsmanship and the inheritor of his ideas here in America was a man named Elbert Hubbard whose name is not widely remembered today but in the early uh, years of the 20th century. Elbert Hubbard was so famous a writer and so widely known, it's almost difficult to conceive of anyone in our generation who is analogous to him. And Hubbard was not only a purveyor of the arts and crafts movement, but he was also a very sharp and incisive voice within the New Thought movement, that very American popular spiritual movement that extolled the principle that our thoughts are causative, that our thoughts have some kind of metaphysical property to them that makes the human mind more than simply an instrument of cognition and motor functions, 
but that the mind itself is a tool, an element, an agency in human creation. Over and above giving commands to the body to create things, over and above serving as a tool of analysis, but actually serving as a channel and a source of extra physical construction of things that actually occur to you, relationships, experiences, and the very content of your life. And to my delight, I found several showcases in the lobby of this grand Disney hotel that held first editions of Albert Hubbard's books. And I was really delighted to discover that because when I walked into this enormous, ornate room decorated in the arts and crafts style, I thought to myself, this is a leaf directly out of the work of Albert Hubbard, but I thought Hubbard is too an obscure, too obscure a figure, too radical a figure, too unusual a figure for his books to be included in a showcase in a room like this. But there they were, there they were, and I was very touched by it. Now, Hubbard and his second wife, Alice, were both students and thinkers who were widely known within the tradition that I was just describing, the New Thought tradition. This tradition of transcendentalism for the everyday person. And New Thought in its popular expressions, while it has enormous sway across the general culture, is sometimes run down. It's sometimes considered a kind of cotton candy spirituality or a sort of simplistic or shallow or even unrealistic spirituality. It goes under names, popularly speaking, like the power of positive thinking or the law of attraction or the secret. New thought itself as a term is not widely known or used today, but people who have adapted its ideas in popular forms very successfully are very well known. And as such, I find that even people within our own alternative spiritual community, broadly speaking, will, and we were talking a little bit about this last night, will sometimes use these popular expressions of new thought as a foil to demonstrate their own sense of seriousness. You know, as we were discussing last night, there's been this backlash against the secret and lots of people will hasten to say, I'm not interested in the secret or any of that hocus pocus, you know. 12 million copies of the secret have been sold, but I encounter almost no one in New Age culture who will claim to own one of those 12 million copies. You know, someone clearly owns one. <laughs> and, um, unless there's one terribly enthusiastic reader out there. Um, and within many reaches of academia, not all, not all, but within many reaches of academia and journalism, a new thought philosophy or its popular expressions is sometimes depicted as part of the problem of contemporary American life, the shallowness of contemporary American life, the degradation of our culture. And again, we spoke a little bit about this last night. The intelligentsia of every generation uh, is always sounding the warning bells about the decadence of our culture. H.L. Mencken was a critic of New Thought. He thought New Thought was the death knell of our culture. Um, and you know, the same is true today in the 21st century. These various forms of popular spirituality are somehow seen as indicators of the inevitable decline of our culture. And I reject that. I reject that entirely. Because I think these popular expressions of spirituality actually can serve to get people thinking about all kinds of possibilities that are in front of them, about all kinds of alternatives that they might possess and might get them started on a path that goes who knows where, who knows where. If any of you, anybody in this room thinks back to a book that proved a source of inspiration at age 12, at age 11, at age 10, 
Who knows what it was? And who knows where that took you? Who knows where that took you? Moreover, <clears throat> there's a tendency to dismiss certain ethical or spiritual ideas in our culture, broadly speaking, across our culture, because of things we've heard about them rather than because of things we know about them or things we've experienced within them. Again, I mentioned that new thought from the age of H.L. Mencken right up through our own time has been derided as a philosophy of wishful thinking, unseriousness, immaturity. Well, I mentioned the name of Albert Hubbard just a moment ago. Hubbard's fame was so great at one time that, as I said, it's difficult to find an analogous figure to him today. In fact, our culture is so segmented and so divided that I almost don't think a figure like Albert Hubbard could emerge in our culture today. But I would note the following. New Thought, which is sometimes described as a kind of foil for conformist or corporatist beliefs, a system of thought that encourages people to think in terms of climbing up the ladder of economic success and that accommodates people to the current social or economic order. That's the critique. Well, most people don't know how Albert Hubbard and his wife Alice died. They died because they were fierce opponents of the outbreak of the First World War. And they felt that the First World War was caused in part by a new industrialized era in which enormous profits could be reaped by selling, as Elpert put it, murder machines to the mob and he inveighed publicly that no more should men profit by selling murder machines to the mob. And he announced his intention to go on what he called a peace tour of Europe and to sail to Europe with his wife Alice and to seek an interview with the German Kaiser and try to urge him to end the war. Before you think this sounds too fanciful, again, Albert Hubbard was an internationally known figure. In fact, there were many heads of state and generals, including in Germany, in Russia, in Japan, in the United States, who made mass purchases of pamphlets of Albert Hubbard's speeches and lectures and talks to give them out to their own military officers or to students at military academies. So he was a figure that had a great deal of international clout. And he and his wife, Alice, set sail in 1915 to tour Europe and protest against the war and to try to get an interview uh, with Kaiser Wilhelm. And the ship that they were on, the Lusitania, was sunk, yes, was sunk by a German U-boat and they were among 1,200 civilian casualties, 1,200 civilian casualties. So as I have observed earlier this week about the founders of the Theosophical Society, Madam H. P. Blavatsky and Colonel Henry Steele Olcott, and how they placed themselves into such physical jeopardy and discomfort by moving from New York City to India, to the very unknown environs of India in 1878, for the furtherance of their own esoteric studies and to participate and to help instigate the Indian independence movement, the critics very rarely understand the physical bravery that some of these people had, the manner in which their beliefs placed them into actual physical jeopardy. It's something that's unknown to many of us in the 21st century here in America and other parts of the West. We get into arguments 
over Twitter and we think, I'll show him, and we think sarcasm is somehow some sort of vital tool of social change or insulting somebody or you know, publishing an embarrassing picture of them with a funny caption is, is somehow a way of striking back at injustice in the world. But these were people who placed themselves into physical jeopardy and Elbert and Alice Hubbard lost their lives for their beliefs, lost their lives for their beliefs. These weren't myopic people. These weren't people who were promulgating a cheap kind of wishful thinking. These were people who believed that the individual possessed transcendent properties. And as such, the individual, if he or she properly understood the role of a human being, also accepted transcendent responsibilities, responsibilities. And how many of us do that? How many of us do that? The notion of boarding a ship during wartime, when ships crisscrossing the Atlantic were being sunk, and there was a real and palpable danger. Well, they did this. They did this. And they did this because they believed that if you can identify within the individual a sense of purpose and a sense of cosmic agency, then it stands to reason that the individual also has responsibility to move through life in a dramatic and meaningful way. We have lost, we have lost that sense of ethical determination. We have lost that sense of courage. And it's not insignificant, it's not insignificant that a figure like Elbert Hubbard, who was so deeply involved in New Thought, was a figure who stood so erect in his life that he ultimately put himself into physical danger and demise for what he believed in. So you can imagine how touched I was to see books by this forgotten man, by this forgotten man in a showcase at this hotel. It meant something. It meant something. These are the figures whose ideas I am attempting to revive and to celebrate and to critique in the Miracle Club. It is an unusual book for me personally because it's a very, very practical book and it's a very, very personal book. Much of what I've written up to this point has been historical in nature. And I've always classified myself as a believing historian and as a sympathetic critic of the movements and the people that I write about. But I've never made any secret, nor have I ever wanted to make any secret, of my own participation in the ideas and the thought movements that I write about. And I felt it was time in the case of this book, The Miracle Club, to be very plain about some of the mind metaphysics practices to which I'm dedicated and offer these practices to the reader, not as a dogma or doctrine, but just as points of experimentation, points of experimentation. Have we lost our taste for individual religious and ethical experimentation? Certainly not all of us, not all of us. We need to experiment together in critical and intelligent ways in order to keep amassing a testimony of the human experience. Testimony, as William James observed, is so valuable and so vital in the pursuit of ethics, in the pursuit of psychology, and the, in the pursuit of science. We sometimes hear from clinicians, and I sometimes will debate with clinicians, who maintain that stories and anecdotes about remarkable things occurring in the life of the individual do not constitute research. And that is incorrect. That is incorrect. Because the fact is, testimony, you can call it anecdote if you want to, but testimony forms a vital part of our record of understanding the world that we live in.
There are common and important things in our shared lives today that we wouldn't know anything about if it weren't for testimony. An example is the use of uh, SSRIs, the, the pharmacological drugs that treat depression and anxiety. We really don't know by what mechanism they work, and we judge their effectiveness, and they are in fact prescribed based on the testimony of the individual. Pain management is understood based on the testimony of the individual, based on the testimony of people you know, pointing to frowny and smiley faces on a chart and explaining to a doctor what level of discomfort they're experiencing. And that doctor is using that to determine his or her prescribing of vital life-preserving drugs. Testimony is at the basis of all branches of our psychology. Testimony and personal experience and the ability of the individual to speak to the validity and the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness of some kind of treatment or course of action forms a record. And these records become clinical data. So I take the testimony of the individual very, very seriously. Critics would push back at me and say, well, what you're really talking about is something called confirmation bias, overlooking the fact that materialists have confirmation bias too. You know, it's a vital fissure and break and problem in human nature that all of us are looking for confirmation of a previously held idea. That's true today of somebody who's uh, researching um, a drug that may lead to immunity from some infectious disease somewhere. Obviously, we have to be very, very careful with how we amass clinical data and testimony, but heaven help us if we ever throw out the idea of testimony as a source of information. So part of why I wrote the Miracle Club is that I want people in our own generation to feel that we don't have to necessarily um, convert some of these practical spiritual ideas about the agencies of the mind into popularized expressions that we may or may not be comfortable with in order to experiment, in order to return to the idea of saying, what does it really mean to be an individual and what powers do I possess that are constant and that are there with me and that can be used and that are being used to navigate through life. The name The Miracle Club is in itself an homage to some of my spiritual heroes. It was a name adopted by uh, a little salon of occult thinkers and experimenters who lived on the west side of Manhattan, who gathered together in 1875 to experiment with ideas of mediumship and karma, reincarnation, seances, spirit contact, all kinds of things. And this little group stayed together for only a very short time. But they later formed the nucleus of a much larger and more long-lived and impactful organization, which was the Theosophical Society. This was the initial group started by Colonel Henry Steele Olcott and his confederate, Madam H. P. Blavatsky, and together with a few others, including names you'd recognize, like Thomas Edison and General Abner Doubleday, they gathered together in a cramped little apartment on the west side of Manhattan, functioned for a little while in this miracle club, as they called it, and then branched into a larger and much more influential organization that really engendered the revolution in alternative spirituality that swept ac across the globe, and so much else besides engendered Hindu and Buddhist revivals in the nations of the East, and whose impact is still being felt today. But I always loved, I'm a romantic, I always loved the idea of this little cluster of intellects getting together without any rules, dogma, and just experimenting. 
The motto of the group was try. That's all, try. They received a mysterious letter during their lifespan. It may have been from one of Madame Blavatsky's adepts of Eastern wisdom. And the letter said, the letter was addressed to Colonel Olcott. And it said, do not give up thy club. Try, with an exclamation point. Can you think of a better motto to adopt in terms of your own spiritual search than that? Try. So in my book, The Miracle Club, I offer a variety of methods that people can try because it's my contention that new thought is a valid spiritual path. In many regards, it's been my spiritual path. I have been gripped for 20 years by the idea that the founders of new thought were correct, that our minds do possess extra physical agencies. And, and I've always felt, I've always felt from the first day I cracked open my first New Thought book, which was The Science of Mind by Ernest Holmes, wonderful book written by a man who relocated to Los Angeles, lovely thinker, lovely man who died in 1960. I felt when I read this book, the indelible impression I had was this is a piece of the truth. It's not the whole truth, but it's a piece of the truth. This notion that your emotionalized thoughts and your mental pictures outpicture in the events of your life. I felt an indelible sense that it was a piece of the truth. And I've never stopped experimenting with it. I've never stopped experimenting with it. But this movement, the New Thought movement, it's so filled with wonder and with possibility and with portent. But it's failed to grow, in my estimation. It's failed to grow. And that's another of the, these things that I try to address in the Miracle Club. There are two primary ways in which the movement has failed to grow. The first is that it has never developed a theology of suffering. We have all witnessed in our own lives or in the lives of other people the occurrence of catastrophe even in atmospheres of morale and encouragement and hopeful expectancy. We have also witnessed tragedy on a global scale, on a global scale, where entire nations have been plunged into civil war or have suffered from some terrible natural disaster like a monsoon or an earthquake. And New Thought has not developed the language to speak to these people. That is a fatal flaw if it's not corrected. And it, it can be corrected. It can be corrected. And it's very important to be clear about this. This is an area where I break with, with New Thought in, in terms of its mainstream of expression. Now, and this is an also, also an area where the, the critics are correct. Everything that I've just pointed out to you has been stated in much more caustic terms by New Thought's critics. And I always say they're right, but they're not right enough. They're not right enough because they overlook too much. They overlook too much. They have found a flaw in the movement, and the movement has to answer for that. But the movement's pioneering figures had such an exquisitely fine instinct for so much and were correct about so much, including advances that we're seeing in placebo studies and neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity and serious psychical research and even aspects of quantum theory. They were right about so much. But they have never been able to issue a kind of course correction dealing with this, this, this absence, this lack of a theology of suffering. Um, the reason why I don't use the term myself, law of attraction, is because I feel that the common use of the term today usually communicates the idea that we live under one mental super law and that our thoughts are determinative of everything. I don't agree with that. I think that's very wrong. 
I believe we live under many laws and forces. It is entirely possible, and personally speaking as a seeker, I believe it's true that mind or consciousness or awareness may be the ultimate arbiter of reality. And I have reasons for feeling that way and I defend those reasons in the book. But within the cosmic framework or the physical framework that we occupy, we experience all kinds of laws and forces, including physical decline and mortality. There's never been a single exception to that. That alone dictates that we live under multiple laws and forces. One is the law of physical demise. But the fact that a law, a physical law, a natural law, is experienced differently in different ways doesn't mean that it's not valid, doesn't mean that it's not occurring you're going to experience gravity in one way on the planet Earth, you're going to experience gravity in another way on the moon or on the planet Jupiter. If you're in space, you're not gonna experience any gravity at all because gravity responds to mass. And where there's an absence of mass, there's an absence of the effects of gravity. Doesn't mean gravity isn't going on, doesn't mean gravity isn't a universal law, but it's altered by other circumstances. Why would we assume that if there is such a thing as a law of mentation, and I think there is, why would we assume that it too is not altered by other circumstances? I've never liked the New Age expression, there are no accidents. I think there are accidents, actually. <laughs> I think we live under a law of accidents. If you live in the Philippines and you're struck by a horrible monsoon, you know, it just so happens that that's where you were born and these are the weather conditions and patterns and there are all kinds of things going on. And if climate change is a problem, there's economic and, and cultural reasons for that too. There's a complexity of things going on. And if you're traveling that day and you're not home when the monsoon strikes, maybe you're the recipient of a happy accident. I think there are plenty of accidents, frankly. Uh, when they're good, we call them good luck. Um, <laughs> What's good luck but an accident? Um, what, the great explorer of Halmar Stephenson said, adventures are accidents. Adventures are what happens when there's an accident, which I always thought was an interesting way of looking at it. Um, nobody goes climbing a mountain hoping, I hope there's a terrible blizzard and my life is threatened, you know. Um, <clears throat> Um, last night, I was defending the work uh, The Secret by um, Rhonda Byrne because I think that that work has attracted too much negative attention. Uh, none of the critics seem to have read it, and I can always tell they haven't read it because as we were joking last night, they always say, boy, the point of all spirituality shouldn't be the manifestation of a Mercedes Benz. There's no Mercedes Benz in the movie. You know, you could sit there watching it over and over. It doesn't happen. And, and so I think, you know, people have this caricatured view of the movie, mostly it's critics, and they use it as a whipping post for everything that's supposed to be unserious about new thought philosophy. But at the same time, I do have my criticisms of Rhonda's approach. I do break with Rhonda's approach because she too promulgates this idea of a law of attraction as this ever operative mental super law. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned to some of you the other day that uh, several, Rhonda grants very, very few interviews, very private person. She did grant an interview to a reporter at the Associated Press, Tara Berghardt, several years ago. And Tara asked her a question that I think all the critics want to ask her, which is, well, look, if somebody dies in the tragic events of 9-11 or the Holocaust, are you saying that somehow through a law of mentation, they brought that upon themselves. And Rhonda basically said, well, bear in mind there are also certain miracles associated with such events, miracles of survival, but yes, there are instances where the uh, thought vibrations of a certain population or group of people or even a nation could be operating on the same vibration as some event that befalls them. 
I disagree with that. I disagree with that. Not only for the reasons that I was just outlining, but for the same reasons that I disagree with critics who are so quick to judge people like a Madame Blavatsky or an Albert Hubbard. And my reasoning is that one should never, one should never speak about physical catastrophe unless you've been through physical catastrophe. Then I want to hear from you. Then I want to hear from you. If you're a survivor of war, I want to hear from you. But I don't want to hear from Rhonda or me or anybody else talking about the experience of someone who's been through catastrophe, whether it's environmental or whether it's, it's warfare, without having passed through such things, him or herself. Because then, in effect, that just becomes casting a stone at my neighbor. That just becomes me explaining away my neighbor's suffering. Well, my neighbor went through this because of reasons X, Y, and Z. Well, let me hear testimony from, from, from him or her if they're still alive to offer it, and I hope they are. And if not, I'll hear it from somebody else who is alive to offer it. I don't want to hear from Rhonda about the Holocaust. I want to hear from Viktor Frankl about the Holocaust, who survived the Holocaust, and who actually has some points to draw that are very much in sympathy with things I write about in the Miracle Club. Him, I wish to hear from. I'm not putting her down. I'm not. I admire her accomplishments enormously, and she's brilliant. But I do believe that her outlook is wrong in this regard. And I do believe that has kept us in the New Thought community from arriving at this necessary theology of suffering. I think that arriving at such a theology <clears throat> begins with the acknowledgement that we live under many laws and forces. And it begins with the acknowledgement that for some people, for some people, catastrophe or an accident or illness has been such that life will be a half loaf of bread. Life will be a half loaf of bread. But if that half loaf can be consumed with dignity and with nobility and with a feeling that you're not without resources and that you can consume this half loaf while standing fully erect, possibilities may open. Possibilities may open. But we first must be able to initiate that conversation. The other area in which I think New Thought has failed to develop and another focus that I bring to the Miracle Club is that by and large the movement has never really come up with or any of its leading lights have come up with a theory, a persuasive, defensible theory of why any of this should be happening at all, of why positive thinking works, if I can put it in those terms. Because I contend that it does work, and I qualify that in the ways that I've just been describing. But for all my qualification, it is my area of dedication. Mind metaphysics is my area of dedication. So if I contend that thoughts are causative, well, why? Why are they causative? It's unsatisfying to read the conclusions of some of the best thinkers in this area because, first of all, some of the early folk, the folk from the late 19th and early 20th century, which is when New Thought produced its really finest minds, very often they would resort to a convention that was very common in the Victorian or just post or Edwardian age that doesn't stand up anymore today. They would refer to the individual as having a soul without defending the fact that we have an extra physical life at all. And they would lapse into almost a kind of presumptive language that men and women have a spiritual life. And if you if you can argue that point of view without defending it, you can extend certain things from there. Uh, references to humanity having a soul uh, don't stand up in the 21st century without some form of defense, unless you're, unless you're really just having a conversation, you know, more, more than writing a manifesto. 
Now, other writers, more contemporary writers, will draw connections between new thought and quantum physics, and I think some of those connections are actually valid, and I think that the critics have overstated the case to which New Age folk have cherry-picked from quantum theory in defense of some of their own cherished ideas. In fact, I think some of this so-called cherry-picking is the start of a valid conversation. But still, the circle hasn't fully been closed. Um, I'm not going to go into an extended argument tonight about the theory that I put forth in the Miracle Club. My theory might be completely wrong, but better to venture a wrong theory and to tie your shoelaces together and fall than not to try to tug your shoes on at all. So in brief, I'll try to explain to you what my theory is, because I think you're entitled to hear from me tonight in as blunt a way as possible. You've sat in traffic to get here. You've rushed to get here. There are other things that you could be doing. And I think I should be as plain as I can be about what my theory is, uh, with the caveat that I go into it in more detail in the book. I do think that we're living in an age in the 21st century in which materialism as a comprehensive theory of life has failed. Materialism, the idea that humanity is simply a sophisticated form of cellular life, no different than an immensely developed amoeba, and it will exist, it will consume, it will excrete, it will die, it will serve as fertilizer for other organisms to exist. That just doesn't cover the basis anymore. I don't think it ever did, but we've certainly gone through periods of materialist ascendancy. We're living in one right now. We're living in one right now. But materialism as a comprehensive theory of life has failed. It has failed. And I can demonstrate how it has failed by using one of the simplest and most quotidian of examples. There are much more complex and much more epic examples I can use, but I'm going to use a simple one. There is a uh, widely regarded materialist professor who describes human beings as moist robots. It's a nice turn of a phrase, <laughs> and it's witty, <laughs> but it's meaningless. And it's meaningless for the following reason. Even one of the most modest fields, in a sense, in mind-body medicine today, one of the most modest but clinically recognized and validated fields, demonstrates that that pretty turn of a phrase is meaningless. And this is the field of neuroplasticity. Clinicians have repeatedly demonstrated, including at labs at UCLA and elsewhere, that your sustained thoughts and thoughts that you repeatedly return to will alter the cellular makeup of your brain, specifically will alter the neural pathways by which electrical impulses travel in your brain. This is demonstrated uh, through brain scans. Uh, studies have been done with people who suffer from OCD or addiction or other forms of ritualistic behavior. And clinical psychiatrists have found, particularly Jeffrey Schwartz at UCLA, who's one of the pioneers of this field of neuroplasticity, have found that if a subject undertakes a program of redirecting his or her thoughts at the very moment of experiencing a ritualistic impulse. And this very often, I should note, it's an interesting side note, this very often involves redirecting your thoughts along the lines of something pleasurable. Because we are creatures who seek out comfort and security and pleasure. So whatever ritualistic behavior it is that you're suffering from, uh, Schwartz's program not only uh, prescribes redirecting your thoughts, but the manner 
in which you redirect your thoughts must be in the direction of something that you find pleasurable, whatever it is. It has to be something that responds to the body's instincts to seek uh, satisfaction, security, relief of some kind of an appetite. And if subjects do this over a sustained period of time, brain scans demonstrate that the very neural pathways that are associated with their habit or addiction or ritualistic behavior will themselves alter. We're witnessing, literally speaking, mind over matter in terms of the cellular gray matter of the brain. It's a fact. It's not controversial. It's widely recognized and the science has been repeated for years and years and years going back to the early 21st century. As of this moment in time, there is no machine, no matter how sophisticated, that by way of its own programming can alter its hardware. It can cause its hardware to be altered by enlisting outside operations. But no computer of any scale has ever altered its own hardware and circuitry, its own actual molecular physical makeup by the running of a program. It may be able to amass new sources of information. It may be able to arrive at compoundingly complex analytical models and cycles, thus arguably increasing its own intelligence. It may be able to alter its programming, thus increasing its operating capacity. But it will not alter the very molecular structure of which it is made up. Now, a friend was arguing to me the other day that with certain advances in nanotechnology, that might become possible someday. And granted, granted, but that has not happened. Human beings are the only living organism that, has demonst that have demonstrated the proven ability to alter matter in this case, the cellular, the cellular matter of the brain by way of thought. We're not moist robots. The materialists are wrong. There are many, many other and more ambitious examples that I could venture. I could talk to you about serious psychical research, a topic that I take very seriously and that I write about in the book. I could talk to you about quantum theory, a subject I take very seriously and that I write about in the book. I could talk to you about placebo studies and what's happening in the area of the placebo response in our generation that would be astounding to the clinicians who pioneered placebo st modern placebo studies following the Second World War. But one example is enough. One example is enough. I've proven the existence of a white crow, so to speak. So we know there are white crows. It doesn't, it doesn't hold, it simply doesn't hold that human beings are nothing but flesh, bone, cognitive, and motor functions. Not only that, but we speak of this idea of creating conscious machines. We don't even know what consciousness is. I've never heard a definition of consciousness that covers all the bases. We should speak that word almost with embarrassment. It's a word that we, that, that almost testifies to our own ignorance of the mysteries of life. If we can't even agree on whether or not consciousness is a localized phenomenon like bubbles in a glass of carbonated water and when the water is gone, the, the bubbles are gone, 
which is how materialists view the human situation, or if consciousness is something that's extra physical, which is my perspective, and the perspective of psychical researchers and uh, serious quantum theorists, then how do we know what we're even trying to arrive at when we speak of the development of conscious machines? So to start with, my contention is that we have evidence enough. We have evidence enough that there's an extra physical dimension to thought, that materialism doesn't cover all the bases. So granted, you know, friends of mine have said to me, look, if I agree with you, if I agree with everything you just said, maybe there is some form of telepathy or some form of ESP or something, and maybe all this positive thinking that you like to talk about is nothing more than the individual human serving as a kind of uh, radio transmitter, and we're always broadcasting our ideas, so to speak, and looking for people who can help us or meet us halfway or do something for us, and maybe that results in things that we call synchronicities or happy coincidences or manifestations or what have you. And they have a point. They, they could be correct. They could be correct. They could be right. It could simply be that I am describing a form of ESP that occurs in everyday life, where there is a field of communication that goes beyond the five senses. That too has been demonstrated by clinical evidence in laboratories. I won't go into that right now, but I talk about the research of one of my heroes, J.B. Ryan, the great psychical researcher at Duke University. He and others, including Daryl Bem at Cornell University today, my good friend Dean Radin at the Institute of Noetic Sciences in Northern California, they have done painstakingly structured studies on extra cognition, precognition, the ability to arrive at continually above average guess rates on a deck of cards, and things keep occurring that violate all laws of statistics, which is evidence enough that there's some means of anomalous transfer of information that we have evidence of in a structured laboratory setting. So again and again and again, we keep bumping into the inconvenient fact that thoughts have extra physical capacities. So what does this say about the thesis that thoughts are causative? What's happening? What's happening? My contention is that if you were to amass together everything that we have learned over the past 80 years, let's say, in the hard sciences, placebo studies, serious psychical research, neuroplasticity, particle physics, the extraordinary things, the surreal, the unreal reality that's continually witnessed in the particle lab where subatomic particles occupy a state of superposition or a wave state, occupy in, in infinite, infinite number of positions in space and are localized only when a sentient observer decides to take a measurement. An extraordinary field that I, I, I won't touch on tonight beyond just referencing it in brief. I go into it in, in detail in the book. If you were to amass together all these ideas and then marry these ideas to the experiences that have been reported and talked about for centuries in mystical literature, in literature that harnesses and organizes the testimony of spiritual seekers, Eastern and Western, from across centuries. There are certain possibilities and suggestions that come into vivid focus. And one of those possibilities and suggestions is the idea that time itself and things occurring in time are occurring in a field of 
infinitude. Everything, in other words, is happening at once. There are episodes of retrocausality, episodes of precognition, episodes of anomalous transfer of information, episodes of particles of matter appearing in wave states, then collapsing into particle states, only if and when sentient observers choose to make decisions. These are insights that are found both within the hard sciences in our own time and within religions in all time. And if you were to group together all these insights, you arrive at the suggestion that linearity itself and the idea of past, present, future is just a, a very convenient and a very necessary and a very powerful organizing device that we use through our five sensory experience to get through life, to organize life, to make sense of life. We are incapable in terms of our day-to-day -day hourly existence of observing life, of experiencing life as in infinitude, as a state of superposition, as a state of infin infinite possibility where all things, possibilities, and outcomes, past, present, future, are happening all at once. We would be overwhelmed by this information. So one of the ways that we navigate through existence as a human species is to organize and experience things as existing in singular form across a linear plane of time. But time is illusory. We know this. We know this. Einstein's theories of relativity have been proven. Time as an experience and as a physical, empirical factor in organic life slows down when an object approaches light speed. We know this as a fact. So time itself is not what we experience and events themselves are not what we experience when we see in the particle lab, for example, that subatomic particles based on the detection of interference patterns, basically, are seen to occupy an infinite number of places and collapse and are localized in one place only when a measurement is made. And people reasonably ask the question, okay, so if this is true, if everything that can be is occurring all at once, all the time, as in the particle lab, why don't we experience this? Why don't we sense this? I only sense one chair being here. I don't sense an infinite number of chairs. How come all the surreal things that seem to be occurring in the particle lab or in the ESP lab or when experiments are done with the relativity of time, how come I'm not experiencing that right now? My life is not a kaleidoscope, a three-dimensional kaleidoscope. It's linear and it's plain and there are floorboards beneath my feet and I feel them. Are you saying I'm delusional? This question was actually taken up by William James in 1902 in his Gifford lectures that became the varieties of religious experience and James's insight is the exact same insight that's being echoed by quantum theorists today without any awareness that James arrived at this insight in 1902. I find this again and again, by the way, that people who are involved in transcendentalist or new thought studies often arrived instinctively at things that quantum theorists and sometimes placebo researchers are validating clinically or at least venturing in the 21st century and they have no idea that they, that they have any forebearers. James made this observation in 1902. He said that the mystic sees life as it really is, infinite. That William Blake was correct. That if we could cleanse the doors of perception, the individual would see life 
as it really is, would see life in its infinitude and its eternity and its multitudinous aspects. And James said that the mystic correctly uh, detects this, correctly understands this, but that the mystic is observing life through very fine sensory equipment, almost like the scientist is observing a drop of water under a microscope. And when you're looking at something with very fine sensory equipment, you're seeing more and more of what's going on. Suddenly it's no longer just a drop of water, but there are molecules and there are atoms and there are tiny organisms in this drop of water. And there's all kinds of things occurring that are unavailable to the naked eye. But that as you pan back, as you pan back, your sensory ability becomes coarsened and you see less and less of what's really going on. So quantum theorists in the 21st century have in their own field faced the same question. What's really going on? Who sees what's really going on? The researcher in the particle lab or the everyday person who says, you know, by God, there's one chair here, not an infinite number of chairs, and it's here whether I take measurement of it or not. Well, there's a, a group of quantum theorists who have made an argument that is in the exact image of what James observed in 1902. And they have argued that, in fact, when you are using exquisitely sensitive sensory equipment, information gathering equipment, such as in the particle lab, you are gleaning all kinds of information about what's really going on. But when you pan the camera back, so to speak, you're seeing less and less of what's really going on, a phenomenon they refer to as information leakage, information leakage. So it may be that the extraordinary things that we're observing under clinical conditions, the infinitude of objects and the collapse of time and the possibility of multiple outcomes, worlds, past, present, future, based upon the perspective and the measurement of the observer, that's reality. That's reality. But because we view our reality through coarsened sensory equipment, of our five senses, we see less and less of what's really happening. And this may be necessary. This may be necessary to get through life. Organizing life as we live it, as we're currently capable of living it, may require the experience of linearity, the experience of duality or singularity of objects, it may require that but that might not be what's really going on, which is why quantum physics seems so endlessly weird to us, which is why clinical ESP studies, no matter how much clinical evidence and no matter how rigorous the conditions under which this clinical evidence is gathered, seems so unrealistic to us, which is why even in the face of brain scans that demonstrate the absolute ability of the individual to use mind to alter matter, a tenured professor can call us moist robots. Because these things seem unrealistic. They seem unrealistic. Even though the evidence keeps mounting and mounting and mounting. And I think it's very possible that the evidence is going to mount to a certain point where our generation will feel that its conception of itself is as challenged by the immaterial as the Victorian felt his or her self-conception was challenged by Darwinism. I think we may be on the very brink and precipice of that. And the point of new thought has always been to ask the question, what, if any, is the practical possibilities of all this material. Because the New Thought folk, for all the flaws that I've identified, they had this instinct 
They had this instinct. And sometimes they even employed the very vocabulary that I'm employing and that we employ in the 21st century more than 100 years ago. My wish is just that the movement keep growing, that the movement not rest on its ability to create popular literature. And I like the popular literature, and I celebrate the popular literature. I love it, in fact, I love it. But being successful in one area doesn't mean that you stop. And I think the movement's success at being able to get across its message in popular literature has contributed to a stagnation. So my wish is to deepen the movement's engagement with its own ideas. And apropos of everything that I was just describing to you, my theory, such as it is, of why thought causation works is this. If an infinite number of things are going on at once, if linearity is an illusion, if through the cleansing of the doors of perception, as Blake put it, life can be experienced in its infinitude, it is very possible, it is very possible that we, through our emotionalized thoughts, our sense of perspective, and our mental visualizations are continually selecting, not manifesting, selecting from among an infinite array of possibilities, past, present, future. And that through our own mental focus, we are drawing a kind of matri matrix grid, so to speak, on top of this infinite reality, and we are pinpointing cross sections in this matrix grid, and those are the things we call our experiences. And it's possible, it's possible, that when we pinpoint one of these cross sections on the matrix grid and say, well, you know, it's 825, I have to wrap up my talk soon, that's my perspective at this moment. In that very instant, in that very instant, I'm not only selecting what I experience, but I'm selecting a past, present, and future as well. I'm selecting a past that feels as real to me as the microphone that I'm holding right now in my hand, that feels as real to me as the tones of my own voice, but that is an act of ever operative selection of past, present, future. All of it feeling vivid along a linear timeline that doesn't really exist, but that is a very necessary organizing device to get through life with the five coarse senses that I am not exclusively possessed of, but that I commonly use that I commonly use, that I am trained in. That's another reason why I don't use the term manifest, because I don't think that's really what's going on. I think we select, I think we select. It's possible that our sensory equipment performs the exact same function as very finely tuned sensory equipment performs in the particle laboratory or in clinical ESP experiments, and that our very capacity to take a measurement by our emotional commitments, our visualizations, and our perspective in and of itself is an act of selection that collapses a wave state of infinite possibilities into one localized experience and that that localized experience brings with it a conception of past, present, future or future possibility that feels as real and as vivid as the tones of my voice but is actually the result of an ever operative and continual act of measurement that we take, selection that we make that determines what we experience. I think that may be what's going on. I could be wrong, but I think that we have to make these efforts 
at this point in the 21st century to try to pool some of this material together. I've made reference to the fact that The Miracle Club is a very practical book without giving you any practical ideas, actually. And I'm going to leave it to you, if you're so interested, to look at the book, to read the book, to experiment with its practical ideas, because there's any number of valid ways to begin to experiment in the private environs of your own life this very night, this very night, with the contention that I've put out to you. And if I leave you with any single impression from this uh, talk, it's not that I want to leave you with the impression that my theories are right, that my theories are wrong, that I have suddenly figured out life from an immaterial perspective. None of that is the case. None of that is the case. But if anything, I'd like to leave you with a sense of almost joyous possibility that you have at your fingertips the ability to experiment with these ideas yourselves. New Thought has produced a wonderful popular literature filled with practical ideas, many of them good ideas in my estimation, and I distill the best of them from my perspective in the Miracle Club, and I encourage you, I encourage you to stand fully erect, as it were, and to experiment with the full range of human possibilities that are our birthrights. Because we are so much more, we are so much more than moist robots. We are products of the infinite, and I call us to experiment with that. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.